So this is the uh, second part of module seven. So again, we're dealing with logarithms. Um, and, and this first problem, number 20, is just a word problem where you have, again, you're looking at a graph and then some questions that will ask you what the actual data is, which you read off the graph. And for other parts, you will um, use the function that is an estimate of the uh, data using uh, logarithm. So um, the function f of x equals minus 7.34 natural log of x plus 69 models the percentage. Um, so part A here says use the function. So we're going to be using that function we just read. Um, 2004, an important thing is what does the input x mean? And if you scan back, it says x is years after 1969. So that would mean 2004 would be x would correspond to x equals 35. Um, so that's what we want to plug in there. So for uh, problem number 20 on this homework, uh, x means basically years after 1969. So uh, 2004 is going to correspond to um, x equals 35 as mentioned so uh, we want to plug that into the function so we're going to do f of 35 which is minus 7.34 natural log of 35 so you're going to have to use your calculator to estimate that and it wants us to do to the nearest percentage I believe so I'm just going to type that into the calculator. So I'm getting 43 is the nearest value. So this is rounded to the nearest whole number. Um, and if you look, uh, so the green bar is the, the men there. So in 1969, which would be this first bar, uh, the actual number is 69.9, so closer to 70. So this is a, a pretty big underestimate. Um, so, so from the function, we got 43. Number of years into the function and evaluate. So did I type something wrong in there? Natural log 35. 31.5 percentage in 2004. Oh, it's asking does this function overestimate or underestimate and by how much? So use the function to find the percentage Okay, now so I don't know what's going on there. Minus 7.34 times natural log of 35 plus 69. I'm getting 43 as the nearest. Oh, nearest tenth. So that would be 42.9. I misread what they wanted us to round to. So over here we want to do that. 42.9. And then uh, this is an underestimate, as we said, and it underestimates, but whoa. Did I click the wrong thing? Uh, are we comparing it to the yellow bar? Green bar is men, the activities. Opposition to feminism, green bar. Oh, we're doing 2004. That's my mistake. Um, I was just looking at 1969, so I just had a complete mental slippage there. Um, we should be comparing to the bar 2004, because that's the year we're plugging into. So we should be comparing 42.9 to 41.7. So this is an overestimate of 1.2. So we're not comparing it to this. That's just the initial value. So that's my mistake. So, so again, this is an overestimate by 1.2.
Okay. Use the function uh, to project how many would uh, express this view in 2010. So that is six years later. So uh, for this part B, so this is part A. For part B, we would do it six years later, which would be f of 41 which would be minus 7.34 times the natural log of this number 41 plus 69. And we'll see what that comes to. So it comes out to 41.7. And that's it. Okay, so now we talk about uh, properties of logarithms. So let's go ahead and do that um, before we jump into this problems. So there's three major properties that will apply to logarithms, and they just have to, uh, they'll work for any base so long as the bases match. And they all kind of correspond actually to rules from exponents. So the first one is if you have, let's say, the log base b of m plus the log base b of n, this is actually the same as the log base b of m times n. And if you subtract two logs with a matching base, That will take the arguments to a single argument, m divided by n. And then the last one is the most useful for solving equations involving logarithms. Let's say you have the log of, say, log base b of m to some power p. Then you can actually bring that exponent down and write this as p times the log of m. So those are the three properties of logarithms that we'll use to uh, both simplify and solve equations. So if you ha now have an unknown, a variable, and an exponent, you can now use that third rule to help solve equations. So for number 21 here, and the, for, for algebraically, this is like the, the biggest utility of logarithms, using them to solve exponential equations. So they want us to um, expand as much as possible here. So uh, basically we just want to expand. So we have the log base 4 of 11 times 5. So we can write this as the log base 4 of 11 plus the log base 4 of 5. Now it's not very clear why you would want to do that with this simple numerical example, but... Um, uh, you know, that certainly if, if you have something that you can evaluate in front um, of a variable, it might be useful to separate it, right? If you had, say, 16 times, uh, the log base 4 of 16 times x, you could split those apart, log base 4 of 16 plus log base 4 of x, and then you would know how to evaluate the log base 4 of 16 because 4 to the second power is 16. So uh, for this one, we just want to type what we have there. Uh, you don't need the arguments in parentheses. I just like to do that so that there is no um, question about what the input is. But I think it'll take it like that. Yeah. Okay, so this one, uh, number 21, is akin to what I was talking about. We can now separate, and then there will be a simplification step as well. So the first part goes exactly as the last problem, log base 15 of 15x. So this is the log base 15 of 15 plus the log base 15 of x. Now log base 15 of x doesn't simplify but we know 15 to the first power is 15. So log base 15 of 15 just simplifies to 1. And so that would be the fully simplified version. And uh, 23 here is also going to be similar. 
we just need to uh, use division here rather than multiplication. So for number 23, again, we are still trying to expand here. You'll have a series of problems after this where you'll want to sim like write as compactly as possible. And that's just going the other direction with the property. So this will be the log base 4 of 4 now minus the log base 4 of y. And again, log base 4 of 4 is just going to be 1. So this simplifies to 1 minus the log base 4 of y. Any questions? Yeah. Um, here we're seeing property number three, where what we want to do is just bring the exponent down. So I suppose we're still saying to expand here. So we've got the log base b of x squared, and we can actually bring that to that's inside the parentheses out front and make that multiplication. So it's two times log base b of x now. So straightforward uses of the property there. Um, number 25 I'm not going to write down, but Again, you just take the whole exponent, the negative 5, and write that in front, and, and that's it. That's all you have to do there. Um, so 26 is a little more interesting because we have an exponent rule to apply first. So number 26 here. Uh, so expand. So we have the natural log of the fourth root of x. So remember, the fourth root can be written as a fractional exponent. So you can write that fourth root of x is actually x to the one-fourth power. So we've got the natural log of x to the one-fourth power. And we can write this now as one-fourth times the natural log of x. I'm sure you could probably write a decimal, too, if you wanted. That's 0.25, so that's not too difficult. All right, um, number 27, uh, we've got two of them, uh, two of the rules involved in order to expand this all the way. First, we have to expand them. The product is two things, and then we'll have an exponent that we need to bring down as well. So for number 27, We have expand and we have this log base b of z to the seventh power times x. So the first thing we want to do is we have the z to the seventh times the x. We can split that into two logarithms. So we can write that as log base b of z to the seventh plus log base b of x. And now to go one step further, we can bring the 7, that's an exponent down in front of the first logarithm. Don't try and do it all at once because you'll mess up. The entire thing that's the argument of the logarithm, the input, needs to be raised to the exponent to bring it out. You can't just do it piecemeal if only one factor is raised to a power. So we have 7 times the log base b of z plus the log base b of x. All right. Okay, so on these we're trying to um, simplify, so I believe we can just, usually these will evaluate. Remember, if you don't see a base written, it's just regular log, that is the common logarithm, so we just infer that the base is 10 there. If it says ln, then the base is that Euler's number E. 
So um, for number 28 here, we I think evaluate is a good enough instruction set. So we have the log of 5 plus the log of 200, which means this is really the log of 5 times 200, property number 1 of the logarithm there. We can take the sum of the common base and multiply the arguments. So then that becomes the log of 1,000. And then can you evaluate that? Remember, we just ask 10 to what power equals that number, and certainly, right? Uh, counting the power of 10 is akin to counting the number of zeros. So 10 to the third power is 1,000. So this will evaluate to 3. Right, so might not have guessed that it would simplify so nicely, but, you know, these properties can make things that look like they might be highly irregular actually be just regular old integers. Okay. So here we're now trying to condense the logarithm. So we're trying to write as a single logarithm if possible. So we're trying to make things more compact rather than expand things here. So we're still using the same exact properties. We're just going the other way. Instead of breaking things apart, we're putting them together. So number 29 here. I guess we'll just say condense. It's kind of a weird, but that's the heart of what they want here. So the log of 5x plus 9 minus the log of x. Well, subtraction, they're both log base 10, so we can just write this as the log of the 5x plus 9 divided by x, since we're subtracting. And that's as far as you can, uh, I mean, okay, I don't know. I think this will be okay, but we do have a common denominator, so if we really wanted to, maybe we could write this as like the log of 5x over x plus 9 over x, and then we would have the log of 5 plus 9 over x. That's slightly simplified, maybe, um, but... I am going to just try and leave it in this first form, the 5x plus 9 over x. I, I don't, you know, sometimes simplified form, uh, there's a matter of kind of like preference to it. Okay, so. Let's try that one and see what it says. It's okay with it, so yeah. Um, although some people, you know, the, the simplification I made, that, that might be considered a more simplified form. Okay, um, so number 30 is interesting. Again, we're still trying to condense these things as a single logarithm. So again, we're still just trying to Write these as compactly as possible. But here's another thing. You might just want to go ahead and jump the gun and you know write these as some fraction, but you can't apply rule number one or rule number two if there's stuff in front. So in this case, we have to put the stuff in front back inside as exponents before we can combine them, right? We can't do any combining with stuff still in front. So what do I mean by that? I mean, well, this 3, I'm going to make that the natural log of, let's say, x plus 8 to the third power. And then the 5, I'm going to make the exponent of x. So I have minus the natural log of x to the fifth. Now that there's nobody in front of each of the natural logs, I can actually put them together. So I'm going to get this single natural log of this kind of complicated looking fraction x plus 8 to the third over x to the fifth and that's going to be my answer it's kind of tricky how you have to write these okay so let's try it like this okay 
Okay, so we've got our x plus a to the third. Bottom of the fraction, we want x to the fifth. And there we go. Okay, any questions on that? You just kind of have to make sure you're going in the right order with applying the rules. And, and that takes a little bit of practice. Uh, number 31 is not so different. We really just need to put all the stuff back into the logs and then combine. So you can do this in one or two steps. So again, we're just condensing. So 5 natural log of x plus 3 natural log of y minus 6 natural log of z. So I'm going to put everybody back in as an exponent. So we have the natural log of x to the fifth plus the natural log of y cubed minus the natural log of z to the sixth. And then the x to the fifth will get multiplied by the y to the third, and then all of that will be divided by the z to the sixth. So I'm kind of using property one and property two both simultaneously there. So we have the natural log of x to the fifth, y to the third, divided by z to the sixth. And that's it. Okay. Um, so there's one property we didn't talk about. That's not one of those main three properties, but this is known as the change of base property. So you'll notice on a lot of calculators, you only have two log buttons, LN and LOG. Some new calculators actually allow you to put in a base, um, you know, because you've got kind of the capacity to um, like digitally assign them. But in the analog days, um, you, you didn't have these like math type screens and it would only show the numerical input. Um, so for that reason, um, it's useful to think about the change of base property. How can we evaluate logs of other bases besides base 10 and base E? So this property is a way to do that. So this is the change of base property. So really what this says is if you have, say, the log base B of X, this will actually be the same value as the log of X, log base 10 of X, over the log base 10 of B, or even the natural log of X over the natural log of B. Or if you had <coughs> some other base you would have rather used rather than 10 or E, you could use that as well. So for number 32 here if we have the log of log base 0.9 of 27.8 you can use either one um, say the natural log of 27.8 over the natural log of 0.9 and then you can go ahead and type that into your calculator to get the approximation probably if you go ahead and just type the expression into Google as well, um, you would get a correct answer, but I'm just going to use the calculator today, and I get, um, it says four decimal places, so for me this is minus 31.5587, if I round to four places. So you want to double check that you can input that into whatever computational device you're using, and your answer agrees with mine. Okay, so the last topic, um, we've pretty much made it through exponential functions and also logarithmic functions. Now we're gonna look at one last topic, systems of equations. So a system of equations is just two equations. So a uh, system of equations. Technically, these are all going to be systems of linear equations. So this is uh, a pair of two linear equations. So 
Uh, if you have two lines, their solution would be places where they intersect. So uh, if you think about possible solutions, there's uh, three possibilities. If you draw two lines in the plane, what could happen? Well, they could cross, they could intersect, which means they meet at one point. So you would have one ordered pair solution. So a single ordered pair. So this would be intersecting lines, or intersect at one place. Two, you could have no solutions. If your lines happen to be parallel to each other, they would never intersect. So parallel lines would have no solutions. And the third possibility is both equations could actually represent the same line. So you would have infinite infinite uh, solutions. So they would be the same line and any point on that line would satisfy both equations so any ordered pair on either line would be in the family of solutions. Now, for number 33 here, uh, so is it a solution? So neg 5, negative 5. And we have the system y equals 4x minus 25 and 5x plus 6y equals minus 5. Well the easiest way to check if it's a solution is plug it into both equations and see if it satisfies both equations. So uh, let's say equation 1 you would be checking is negative 5 equal to 4 times 5 minus 25. So I'm plugging 5 for x and negative 5 for y into the top equation and I'm asking is negative 5 equal to 20 minus 25 yes it is so that one checks out then I check equation 2 so then I'd be asking well is 5 times 5 plus 6 times negative 5 the y value is this equal to negative 5 well is 25 minus 30 equal to negative 5, and that checks out as well. So since it checks out in both equations, it is a solution. Of course, when you ask a question like this online and you give more than one attempt, then huh, you just try it a bunch of times. Okay, so solve for substitution. So substitution is one of the, you know, the most common techniques in math. If you have uh, an alternate form of one expression, you can substitute that alternate form into the other expression, usually reducing the number of letters. So that's what happens here. Um, so in number 34, we have x plus y equals 16, and we also have y equals 3x. Well, basically, that means I can change the y in the top equation into a 3x and find out the x value where they meet. So... I can just write this as x plus 3x equals 16, and I'm substituting 3x in for y. So then I have 4x equals 16. I divide by 4, and I have x equals 4. But when we have a solution set, it's not sufficient just to give one of the letters. You have to do both of them. Once you have that, you can plug it into either equation and figure out what it should be. So I can plug this x equals 4 into the bottom value to get the value of y. So y would be 3 times 4, which is 12. So then I could say the solution is 4, 12. And then I'm all done because I found both x and y. Notice the two other possibilities. We have infinitely many solutions or no solution. So that's what we talked about at the beginning. Okay.
again solve by substitution. This time the substitution isn't quite as obvious, but what we have to do is just pick an equation and solve for one of the letters. So number 35 here we have, so I'm just going to say solve, 7x plus 8y equals minus 20, and 5x minus y equals 26. So I want to pick the equation, so what we want to do is solve for a, let's say, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to solve for y in equation number 2. Okay, so I have 5x minus y equals 26. So I'm going to subtract 26 and add y to both sides. So that'll move y to the right-hand side of the equation and put all the other stuff on the left-hand side. So the minus y plus y will cancel on the left, and I'll just be left with 5x minus 26, and on the right, the 26 minus 26 will go away, and I just have y. Okay. So then what we want to do is we want to change y in equation 1 to 5x minus 26. That's our substitution step. So I look at that top equation, 7x plus 8y, and where it says y, I'm going to replace it with 5x minus 26 in parentheses. So I have 5, 7x plus 8, and then I replace that y by 5x minus 26. And it's important that you use the parentheses there, and that equals minus 20. Now I have an equation that only contains x's, so I'll be able to solve it. It goes all the way back to module 3 or something. So I have 7x, I need to distribute the 8, so I get 40x minus, what, uh, 160 and 48, so minus 208, equals minus 20. Okay, so these will combine to 47x, and just while I'm at it, let's go ahead and add the 208 to move the regular numbers to the other side. So I have 47x equals 188. Then I divide by 47, and I get x equals 4. How do I find y now? Well, I, I just go back to that expression I had, right? I know that y is equal to 5x minus 26. So I do 5 times the 4, replacing the x, minus 26. This is my value of y. So 20 minus 26 is negative 6. So the solution here should be 4 comma negative 6. Does that make sense? All right. Continuing on, uh, we have another uh, system, and this one is the addition method. So the idea with the addition method is um, what you want to do is you want to add the equations together to eliminate one of the variables. So let's go ahead and do that here, number 36. This method is often faster, so I'll say solve by addition method. So I have these equations, 2x minus 3y equals 0, and 3x plus 2y equals minus 13. So I want to focus on the y. So you just need to pick one of the letters and stare at it and say, okay, if I'm going to eliminate the u, how can I multiply the equations by a number that's going to make them the same number with opposite signs, right? So I'm, I'm really looking at the minus 3y and the plus 2y. And what I want to do is I want to make the top equation so it has negative 6y and the bottom equation so it has positive 6y. 
That way, when I add them together, all the y's disappear. So the way I can do that is I could take the top equation and multiply everybody by 2. And I could take the bottom equation and multiply everybody by 3. So multiplying the top equation by 2, that means I multiply each term by 2, gives 4x minus 6y equals 0. And if I do the bottom equation by 3, I get 9x plus 6y equals minus 39. So then what I can do is I can add those two equations together and the y's go away. So I end up with 4x plus 9x is 13x. 0 plus negative 39 is minus 39. Then I just divide by 13 and I get x equals minus 3. All right. So I didn't do any substituting. I just looked to find a common multiple so that I could eliminate everybody. Um, so then what you have to do is you have to plug x back in. So plug, let's say, x equals minus 3 into equation 1. All the way at the beginning. So I take 2 times negative 3 minus 3. And you could have plugged into equation 2 as well. Minus 3 times y equals 0. So I have uh, minus 6 minus 3y equals 0. So I can just add 3y and then divide by 3. So I have negative 6 equals 3y. And I divide by 3. So I have negative 2 as my value for y. So the solution here was negative 3 comma negative 2. Remember, when you write that ordered pair, x always comes first. Sometimes uh, students will get it backwards because, you know, sometimes you solve for y first, sometimes you solve for x first. But when you write the answer, the x always comes first. So the solution is negative 3 comma negative 2. Okay, solve by any method. These last few we're going to illustrate kind of the odd cases that we haven't seen appear yet. At least that's my recollection. Uh, I was writing the number. So this is uh, number 37. So solve. 6x equals y minus 3 and you also have um, 6x minus y equals 7 um, many ways you could do this we already have 6x solved for so we could substitute y minus 3 where 6x appears in the bottom equation. So substitute y minus 3 for 6x in equation number 2. So we would get y minus 3 minus y equals 7. Well, y minus y is just 0. So I end up with negative 3 equals 7. Well, certainly that's not true. So when you end up with a statement that's completely false like that, that means it's never true for any value of the numbers you're plugging into them. So this would happen when there's no solution. So when you end up with a statement that's patently false like this, that means the lines are parallel. Hence, there are no solutions. Or, phrased slightly differently, the solution set is empty. Um, this one... 
So solve by the addition method. Uh, you could do it many ways, but number 38 here. I'm again just going to say solve. So x plus 3y equals 2, and 4x plus 12y equals 8. You might immediately recognize that these are in fact just the same line, right? If you take equation 1 and multiply it by 4, you get exactly the same thing as equation 2. But um, if we were trying to actually do elimination, we'd say, okay, well, we want to get rid of x, so maybe I would multiply the top equation by negative 4 and keep the bottom equation the same. If you really just had tunnel vision and said, what do I do with the elimination method? Okay, let's eliminate x. So get opposite coefficients for x and then add together. We would get minus 4x minus 12y equals minus 8. And down here we would get 4x plus 12y equals 8. And then when you add together, you get 0 equals 0, which is always true no matter what. So that says... Uh, that really both equations are the same line. So any point on either line is, or on any point on the line is a solution. So there are infinitely many solutions. So one thing, if I give this type of thing on pencil and paper, uh, an answer I often see is a student will write, once they figure this out, they'll say all real numbers. But all real numbers doesn't really make sense in this context, right? Because the solutions we're talking about are ordered pairs. So it's not all real numbers because these are pairs of real numbers that represent points on the graph. So... It's not all ordered pairs, it's just ordered pairs that are on that line, and there are infinitely many points on any line. So They specify actually the solution set here, so any x or y that is on that line. Okay, and then this last one is a uh, word problem, so... We have the um, we have this company. It has a fixed cost of twenty four thousand and sixty dollars to produ produce each canoe. So when you have a uh, a simple variable cost model, it's always just going to be your fixed cost plus your variable cost times the number of things that you're producing. So our cost function here is twenty four thousand plus sixty times x, which is representing the number of canoes that I'm making. Right? Does that make sense? Cost twenty four thousand dollars to you know, I don't know, build a shack that I'm gonna do my canoes in, and then the wood for each new canoe that I'm making costs sixty dollars, roughly. Right? So, so that's that's a quick way to think about it. So I only buy the house that I'm building them in one time, and then every time I build a new canoe, it costs sixty more dollars. So that's why that's increasing for the number of canoes I intend to build. How much money am I making? Well, I'm making a hundred and twenty dollars for each canoe. Uh, I forgot the x. 120 times x. And then if they ask, what is the break-even point? So these are really two lines, and the point where they cross, that's going to be the number of canoes I need to build in order to first make a profit. So for number 39 here, I just set those two equations equal to each other. So, right, I, ha I set, set c of x equal to r of x and solve. So for my particular problem I have 24,000 plus 60x equals the 120x. So I just subtract 60x on both sides. I get 24,000 equals 60x and I divide by 60 So I have x is, oh, what is that, 400? 
240 and then the uh, yeah so what is the break-even point well the revenue and the cost we have to figure that out so you could plug it into either equation um, let's use revenue because that's a simpler equation so R of 400 would be 400 times 120 which would be 4, 8, and 3 zeros. So our break-even point, they say an ordered pair, so 400 comma 48,000. And that's it. Um, this means when they buy and sell, the revenue is equal, money coming in equals money going out. So you don't start to make profit until you've sold your 401st canoe. That's a, at, at that time your revenue exceeds your costs. But before then you're always right. You would say you're in the red if you've sold um, 0 to 400, but you would be in the black once you make more than uh, 400. All right. So I think that's it for Module 7. Are there any questions on any of the ones we went over today? Okay.